Welcome back everybody. We are ready for another set of notes in unit five. So go ahead and flip to our unit five table of contents. We are going to put these notes on page 46. And the title of these notes will be X intercepts and zeros. So X intercepts and zeros. So once you get that written down, you will need to take the set of notes, fold it and tape it down onto page 46. So go ahead, pause this video and get that done real quick and then push play when you're done. Okay, so your notes should be taped in. So I want to explain why we are doing these notes. So we have talked about x-intercepts and zeros. It's all about where does the graph cross the x-axis. What we haven't done is connect the graph to the equation. So when we get on the inside of this foldable, we're going to be looking at the equations and the graphs. So that's the whole goal of this foldable. So first thing we got to do is make sure that everybody understands what a zero is. So a zero of a function is an x value that makes the value of the function zero. Okay. We are wanting to know, this right here is the number zero, by the way. This is the zero on the y-axis. So we're wanting to know when does the graph equal zero. So it's talking about the x-axis right here. So we are looking for where does the graph cross the x-axis, aka zero. So we, when I look at this graph, we have two different spots where it actually happens. We have one here and one here. And these two points are called zeros and they're called x-intercepts. There's a difference between the two though. So zeros, and I'll write them in different colors, zeros are one and three. Zeros are just the numbers of where it actually happens. Now, x-intercepts are talking about those same points, but we need the ordered pairs. So x-intercepts always have to be ordered pairs. So the ordered pair of this point right here is one zero. And the ordered pair of that point right there is three zero. So yes, they are talking about the same spot on the graph, but they are very different things. So please be careful and make sure that you know the difference between these two because it'll show up on a lot of tests, okay? The next thing that we need to do is talk about how many zeros can a quadratic function have. So we can't say an unlimited amount because we're dealing with a U-shaped here, so we are limited to how many times we can actually cross the x-axis. So I'm going to draw, and I want you to draw the same thing three small graphs, just like this. Just like that. We can add arrows. Okay, on that first graph, I want you to draw a parabola that looks like this. It's floating above the x-axis. Okay, you should have that done now. Whenever we are talking about zeros, we're talking about where does the graph cross the x-axis. Well, if I look at this parabola, this parabola doesn't touch the x-axis. So we would put no zeros. So that's an option. And we see that one quite a bit, so just be careful with that one. Okay, I want you to draw another graph where the vertex is sitting on the x-axis. So here's what that would look like. Our vertex, and then maybe our graph goes up like this, and looks like that. When we're talking about the zeros of the graph, we're looking at the x-axis, well this graph only touches it one time. 
So this means that we're going to have one zero. Or the one that we see a lot is the one that crosses the x-axis twice. And so when I look at this one, I have a zero here and a zero here. So there are two zeros on this one. And these are your only options when it comes to the number of zeros that you are allowed to have. And the reason why it caps out at two, the reason why we can't go over two is because think about the shape of a U. A U pretty much only has two sides and these arrows are continuing forever. So it's not like they're gonna turn and come back down. So these are our options on how many zeros we can actually have to a quadratic function, okay? Okay, so let's take a quick look at the inside of these notes. Remember, the inside is where I said that we were going to connect the equation to the graph. So far, we've only been looking at graphs and talking about how many zeros a graph actually has. Now we're going to look back at the equation, find the zeros from the equation, and then go to the graph. So I really want you to see that these two go hand in hand, okay? They're the same thing, pretty much. So... In order to actually accomplish this, we need to take a look at the equation. We have to start with the equation because our, our graph is blank. So this top equation is in standard form. I have said it multiple times. I know it's in standard form because I have the highest exponent first and then they go down from there. This second equation that you see is the same equation, but it's in a form called factored form, which I wrote that over there to the left. So this is factored form. We're still talking about the same equation. I just rewrote it to be in factored form. Now in about a week and a half, I'm gonna show you how we actually get from equation one to equation two. That's why I drew that little arrow. There is a process to get there and I'm gonna show you that in about a week and a half. So just know that there are some steps in between here, but this is where we're gonna end up getting to. So now that we know this and like understand what that arrow means, this is factored form, and I want to know when does this equation equal zero? Because remember, this equation is going to be on this graph here in a minute. I want to know when is this equal to zero. So what we need to do, and I'm going to write it in a different color, we're going to replace y with zero. Because I'm wanting to know when does this equation equal zero? Or, in graph terms, when does the graph cross the x-axis? This zero represents the x-axis. Okay? Now we have something that we need to use a property on in order to finish solving it. We are going to use something that's called the zero product property. Okay? So it's the zero product property. So I'm going to explain it, and then I'm going to actually apply it to this. So I'm going to, like make it simpler for you, okay? If I have zero is equal to A times B, okay? So these are two numbers. It doesn't matter what the numbers are. In order for it to be zero, then either A is equal to zero because zero times B is gonna be zero or B could be zero. So then it would look like this. right? Because in order to get zero on the left side, either one of these letters has to be zero. Because think about it, anything times zero is zero. Okay, now let's look back at our equation that we've got. We have two numbers. We don't know what they are. They're equal to zero when we multiply them. So how we do that is we use the zero product property. And here's how you actually use the zero product property. We're gonna take both of these and set them equal to zero. So that here's what it is. It's gonna be x minus five equals zero. And then the next one is x minus, or sorry, x plus one equals zero. So we know that one of these has to be equal to zero. So we're gonna figure out what the numbers are to make it be zero. Okay. So I want to make a little note right here. From here to here, we used the zero product property and we can abbreviate that with ZPP. So from here to here, we did the zero product property. 
And you can remember it because we're supposed to plug in a zero and then split it up and do the zero product property. Well, now it's just one step equations and then we have our zeros. So in order for me to solve this one right here, all I would need to do is add five to both sides. So I'm gonna add five, those cancel out and I'm left with X is equal to five. And on this one, I'm gonna have to subtract one from both sides to get rid of it. So this one is just X equals negative one. And there are your zeros. So without looking at the graph, these are your zeros. Now I know it seems kind of confusing, but I had to explain why behind it, okay? And we're gonna do more practice with this, okay? So what you just found, I'm gonna go back to the front, what you just found were these two numbers. You found where the graph crosses the x-axis. That's what you just found without even looking at the graph, okay? So now we're going to sketch the graph. So it says identify the zeros, we did that, and sketch the graph. So now we're going to sketch the graph. Sketch does not mean 100% accurate. What does need to be accurate is the spots where the zeros are. So I'm gonna have a zero at positive five. So I'm just gonna put a point right there at positive five. And then I've got a zero at negative one. So I'm gonna put a point at negative one. So there are my zeros. And now I just need to sketch a parabola. So it's gonna be a U-shaped. This one is gonna open up simply because there is not a negative in the very, very front. So, remember, it does not have to be perfect. Does not have to be perfect. There we go. So as long as it looks something like that, then you're good. Really, the most important part are the zeros. So make sure that you get the zeros in the right spot. All right, I'm gonna do one more with you. We're gonna go through this one a little bit quicker and then I'm gonna have you do number three on your own. So let's check out number two. Again, we start with standard form and then we go to factored form. I'm gonna show you the factored form in about a week and a half like how to actually get there. So I need to replace that Y with zero because I'm looking for when does the equation equal zero. Because remember that zero represents your X axis. That's what we're looking for. And now we're going to apply the zero product property and we're gonna split these up and set them equal to zero. So I'm gonna make a little note right here that I did the zero product property right here. That's a, a crucial step. And then we just finished solving. So I'm just gonna subtract four. So this is gonna be X equals negative four. And then on this one, I'm just gonna subtract two. X equals negative two. And these are my zeros. So again, I didn't even look at the graph, but I know where the zeros are. So now we just need to sketch it. Sketch does not have to be accurate. Just make sure your zeros are in the right spot. So we have a zero at negative four and at negative two. And the graph does open up because I do not have the negative. And there we go. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to pause this video and go work on number three. Do as much of it on your own as you possibly can before you hit play. Because the, the faster you can do this on, the own, on your own, the better. Okay, so go ahead, pause this video, and then push play when you're done. And here is number three. 
So I plugged in a zero because I'm looking for the zeros and then I split it with the zero product property and finish solving. After I finish solving, I can actually plot where my zeros are and then sketch my graph. So hopefully you've got four and negative three. Now, now that we have finished all of these, I want you to notice a pattern, okay? What, and I'm gonna show you on all of them. Whatever the factors were, because these are called factors, that's why it's called factored form. Whatever the factors are, the zero or the solution is the opposite of that. So you could do five minus five will be zero, negative one plus one will be zero. So it work, it's just the opposite of that. Then on this one, check it out. We have x plus four up here, negative four is the opposite of that. X plus two, negative two, opposite. And then down here, the one that you just did, minus four, positive four, they're opposite. Plus three, negative three, they're opposites. So that's another quick way that you can figure these zeros out. Make sure though that you have your graph done correctly. We don't wanna put those zeros in the wrong spots. Okay, and now we have a couple of word problems to do. So I wanted to give you some word problems just so that you could understand what zeros are in real life, okay? So as we go through these two word problems, we're gonna talk about what the zeros are in real life. So we'll start with number one. I'm gonna read it. I have a highlighter, so I'm only gonna highlight. You can underline it if you don't have a highlighter. We're gonna highlight the important stuff from this word problem because remember word problems especially wordy ones like this one they try to distract you with all of the words so we're going to work through this one so it says a baseball coach uses a pitching machine to simulate pop flies during practice the quadratic function below models the height in feet uh, of the baseball after x seconds so we need height in feet that's important and then x seconds. So that tells me that x represents seconds and the equation is talking about height. So the question is, how long is the baseball in the air if the ball is not caught, okay? So I have an equation right here. And what I'm gonna do, since I don't know how to factor yet, because you would normally factor right here, but we don't know how to do that yet. So. If you don't know how to start or where to start or how to do something, you need to graph it. You need to look at the graph. So I'm gonna graph this. So remember, you start with the Y equals button. You type in what you see. It's gotta be exact after the equal sign. Now my variable X is right here beside alpha. So X squared plus 70X plus 10. So I've got my equation typed in just like I need it to be, and then I'm gonna hit graph in the top right. So there's my graph. Looks a little bit weird. Looks just like two lines that were graphed. But remember that this is a parabola. And if you've ever watched a baseball game, pop flies are a parabola. They're just upside down due to gravity, okay? So what I wanna know is the zero, and what is the zero in real life? and we gotta think or figure out how long it took for that ball to get to the zero, okay? So, first thing I wanna do is talk about the bottom half of this graph. So the zero, okay, the zero is right here. Everybody agree with that? It's right there and right here. Everything underneath that spot is the ground. So in this particular problem, the ground is our zero. So all this down here does not exist. We're wanting to know when, so here's the baseball, it goes up in the air and then it comes down. Here's when it hits the ground. I wanna know how fast did it hit the ground. So I can go, and also I'm gonna show you a second, a second thing real quick. So if you hit second graph to go to the table, you're gonna see a couple of things. So mine automatically went to around here, but remember you can scroll. So if I look at this, I see that my numbers are negative and they go positive and then they start with negative again. Remember that X represents seconds in this. So we're talking about time and time cannot be negative. So this negative one second doesn't exist. So at zero seconds, this ball was 10 feet off the ground because it's in the pitching simulator, remember? And at one second, the ball's at 64 feet in the air. Two seconds, it's at 86. Three seconds, it's at 76. 
four seconds, it's at 34 feet. Five is negative 40. This part right here is where another issue arises. Negative 40 is technically underneath the ground. And when a baseball hits the ground, it doesn't go underneath the ground. So we actually have to stop at four. So sometime between four and five is when that ball actually hits the ground. Since our calculator doesn't give us like the exact decimals, we're just gonna estimate it. So I'm gonna go to second table, or sorry, I'm just gonna hit graph. And I know that it happens between four and five seconds. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mess with my window range. So I'm looking in between four and five. So if I click on this and I'm looking at my X axis, I'm gonna just change my X axis to maybe zero to five. And then I'm gonna click graph. So now my Y axis stay the same, it's still 10, but now I've basically zoomed in on my X axis. So this, number, this little tick mark right here is four and that one is five. We need to estimate about when does it actually hit the ground. So as long as you're somewhere close, it doesn't really matter. That looks to me about four and a half. So we're gonna go with four and a half. So, but before we write out a statement to answer the question, I want you to draw this graph, like in what it looks like in real life. So here's what I'm talking about. I want you, we're gonna draw, and it needs to look like this, because remember, this is the ground, okay? This line is our zero. This is gonna be our time. So we have one, two, three, four, five. We need five because remember, we found out that it hits the ground in between four and five seconds. And then we have our height on this side. And since the question wasn't particularly about height, we don't really need to put any tick marks over here. We just want to know when does it hit the ground or hit the zero or whatever. So we're going to just draw a parabola just like this. And we're gonna let it hit the ground right there. So this is the representation of our situation with the baseball. I made mine start up a little bit from the origin because remember it said that the height was 10 feet, but that is not as crucial as the time here because the question was about time. So after you get that drawn, I just want you to create a sentence that says, that answers the question. How long is the baseball in the air if the ball is not caught? So we can say the baseball is in the air for approximately 4.5 seconds. So the baseball is in the air for approximately 4.5 seconds. Now, it is extremely important that we include the word approximately because we estimated. We are not 100% accurate that 4.5 is correct, so we need to put the word approximately in here just to be safe. Okay? Now let's take a look at the second word problem that we've got. So remember, this is another real life situation. It says the quadratic function below models the height in feet of a flying fish above the water after X seconds. How long is the flying fish out of water? So again, this is very similar to the baseball situation. The important part is height in feet. And then we have X seconds. So X represents time again. So we wanna know how long is this fish out of the water? So again, we do, we do not know how to factor yet. So you will need to go to your calculator. And I have to show you something because I did not reset my calculator. So anytime, and this is super important, anytime that your calculator does, like the graph screen doesn't look the correct way to you, you need to change the windows. So that's how zoomed in it is. So I'm gonna click window. Your calculator's normally set from negative 10 to 10. So on the minimum and maximum sides, we need negative 10 to 10. And then you click graph again and it zooms it back out. Okay, so there's my graph from last time. So I'm gonna graph a new one. So I'm gonna clear that out and I'm gonna type this in just like I see it. So negative 16x squared plus 11x. And then I'm gonna click graph. 
Now check this out. This is an even smaller parabola up here because think about it. This is a fish jumping out of water. We know that a fish cannot jump really high out of the water. So what I wanna do is I wanna zoom in, okay? So I'm gonna zoom in. It looks like maybe if I go to like negative one to two maybe on the x-axis and then this fish doesn't look like it jumped that's number that's two so i'm just going to change my windows so i'm going to show you how to do that i'm going to zoom in on this on the parabola without messing with that zoom button so i'm going to click window and for my new minimum for my x value i'm going to change it to a one or sorry negative one and then my maximum i only want it to go to two um y minimum uh we'll go to we'll go negative five and then y maximum we'll go to five so then if I click graph, see how we have refigured our graph and we've just zoomed in. You can do that anytime you need to. You just need to remember to change it back when you're done. So here's my fish, okay? So now our quote unquote zero is right here, which is the river or lake or whatever body of water that this fish jumped out of. So this is the second that he that it jumped out of the water it went up this is about two feet so this fish jumped about two feet out of the water and then started he, its decline back into the water we want to know this point right here and we're going to have to estimate it again because when i go to my table this is what i see when i go to my table so in this particular situation these negatives can exist because that's technically underwater so at zero seconds is when that fish jumped out of water and then look at one second it's negative five feet in the water so that means that this fish jumped out of the water and then back in the water before a second had even passed so we just really need to focus on the graph on this one so again I want you to draw the graph of this so again this bottom piece is time but this time we only need to have like one second in there because the fish was in the water within one second anyways. This side is still height. And since it only goes up to two, we can actually put the height on this one. And then you just need to sketch out that parabola. So it looks something like that. As long as it's close. Now, I want to make a point here again. For this particular example, this part of our graph does exist. It's just underneath the water. Which normally we don't talk about any of these points down here. We're normally concerned about the zero. So just make sure you understand the x-axis part. Now, before we come up with our sentence, I want to show you how to reset your window. So go to window, click window. And we need everything from negative 10 to 10. So I'm going to go down to minimum, change it from negative 10 to 10. And then that re-centers my graph to what we need it to normally be. Okay? So now that we have our graph drawn, let's just estimate when the fish hits the water again. So we need to make sure that we answer the question, how long is the flying fish out of water? So we can say the fish... is out of the water for approximately what do y'all want to say i mean there's more than a half maybe 0 0.8 we'll go with 0 0.8 0 0.8 seconds And there we go. So your sentence doesn't have to be something extravagant. Just answer the question, but make sure you use the complete sentence. So like subject, verb. Okay? So those are some real world examples of what zeros actually are in real life. But the most important part of today is I need you to make sure that you understand that these zeros correspond to an equation. That's the important thing. So we're connecting the equation and the graph together. Okay? 
good job and I will see you guys next time.